Week 10, price. Now, price as a marketing concept is a combination of the financial costs and the non-financial costs to bring together the concept of the total price. On the financial cost side, the most obvious one that we're familiar with is the acquisition cost. This is what it this is the payment you make for the exchange to buy the product. What we also have though is we have costs associated financial costs associated with the use of the product. And these are ongoing monthly subscription fees, these are service fees, additional charges, or consumables required to make the product work. We also have a couple of other costs, and that is the disposal cost, and this is where the consumption of a product incurs a charge fee or other financial cost for getting rid of the used product. And we have the search costs, which is where actually finding the product in the first place comes with a either a price tag, either there's a search premium, or it's simply the amount of effort that you've had to put in before you acquire the product. On the other side, the non-financial costs. Now, non-financial costs can also incorporate the search acquisition use and disposal in terms of time, energy, effort, opportunity, compatibility, risk, and observation of use. To break each of these down, a non-financial cost of time is the amount of literal time that you're going to need to use a product. If you are looking at a co-creation of value scenario, how many minutes into the use of the product will you be before the product is being able to be co-created at a satisfactory level? If you're looking at, say, the purchase of a book, how long will it take to read? If you're looking at the purchase of a video game, how long will it take to play? What's the replayability like? If you're looking at a live sports event, how much time does it cost to go to the event? including travel time there, travel time afterwards, queuing time. Similarly, energy. What's the actual drain, physical drain, on your energy reserves to use the product? This can be emotional energy, this can be physical energy. Similarly, effort. How easy is it? What's the trade-off between use, effort expended, and return? You go to the gym, the gym costs you a service fee. There's financial cost of training. Then there's the time required to train. Then there's the energy you expend in the process of training. And then there's the effort you expend in the process of doing the exercises. So energy and effort are two separate things. Energy is the overall drain on your physical reserves and mental reserves. Effort is the sort of the spike point, the peak activity. There's also the opportunity costs. For every action that we undertake, there are alternative actions we could have done. In recording this video, and in watching this video, there were opportunity costs to both. There are opportunity costs to you now in watching this video, but there may also be opportunity benefits. This may be the financial, non-financial cheapest way of doing the subject for you. This may be the optimum path. There's also, when we start thinking about the product itself, the extent to which it's compatible with your existing lifestyle and the changes that would be required to make it compatible become costs. Some of these changes may or may not be beneficial. They may cause you, different, cause you problems, cause you challenges. So we raise in risk. The perception of risk and the actual risks themselves, whether they pay off or not, the perception of the danger, challenge, or likelihood of something going wrong become part of the overall cost. And lastly, the observation of the use. The cost, again, tied back to the Rogers five factors. Compatibility is one. Observed use. What is the cost of actually undertaking the behavior in the presence of others? And it's this final one that's actually quite often overlooked, is the idea of 
as marketers, we promote brands, and brands have in-group, out-group. If you are part of a, we usually promote our brands in terms of the value that the in-group provides. But if you are walking through the out-group camp, wearing your branded t-shirt, and I'm going to pick sport for a moment. If you are walking through the Canberra Raiders fan base wearing your South Sydney Rabbitohs jersey, you're going to really experience the non-financial costs of being observed using a rival brand. So there are certain things like the embarrassment or necessarily you know, is the product loud, obnoxious, is the product, does the product draw attention to you? You want the benefits but you're not keen on the attention. These are some of the costs of observed use. Now, in terms of price, price is the overall sa the sacrifice the consumer or customer is willing to make in order to acquire the value that you are offering. It's quite often uh, covered under the idea of the exchange. So we think create, communicate, deliver, and exchange. Price is often seen as the exchange. Price is also part of the delivery, the offering that has value in terms of back to the firm, the delivery of value back to the firm, but also any delivery costs are part of the total financial price. So acquisition costs can include delivery charges, which brings us to the total price concept again financial price plus non-financial price, the assumed cost of consumption and use, and then the audience's, your target audience's perception is based on the total price concept. So there's a couple of marketing considerations that we need to address. First of all, price is obviously relative to value. The greater the value, the greater the price you can expect to be able to charge. But at the same time, value is subjective, price is subjective. You may find that the price itself can be a mechanism to communicate. It can be of value in and of itself. So many customers have a reference price. All of us tend to have a sort of sense of what something's worth. When you, we look at a product, we look at the price tag and we go either, yes, I'll have it because it's within my pricing and my budget and my preferred options. Look at it and go, I like it, but not at that price. The value is not enough versus the price that you're being expected to pay. Or no way, that's way too expensive. It's beyond your reference price tolerance. So even little things like the zone of tolerance, the perception expectation, zone of tolerance will apply as a similar mindset, a similar facet of our thinking of we have an ex a reference price which is our expectation of what something should cost. And then we have the actual price which is what it does cost in the store. And then we look at the two, we make the comparison if the price delights us because it's below our reference, but still doesn't make us feel that the value of the object has been diminished, then we are likely to see it as a bargain and yeah, sets off our internal psychological rewards and we're more likely to consume the product. Also, in terms of price, price sitting inside the offering that has value, an expensive object that is known to be expensive communicates a social message about the wealth and financial value of the individual. So they will see a benefit and a value in consuming an expensive product if it's a social signal. And this is why we have luxury brands. This is why we have high-end luxury boutiques. This is why we have bragging rights as a feature we can sell why exclusivity, exclusivity by price, or there's only 10 in the world of these objects, becomes a viable and valuable way of engaging key target markets. Now, there's also a subset. There's a level in here, um, a sort of super consumer level, 
where you can sell prestige price within certain categories of fast-moving consumer goods. So you can have a luxury brand prestige priced ice cream. You know, 500 mils or 750 mils of ice cream where for five liters of the stuff you pay, you could pay half, third, quarter of the price. You can have a perceived luxury product. A super expensive ice cream because it can then be used as a social signal. Someone can buy this for themselves to treat themselves and go, well, I wouldn't normally spend $10 on an ice cream, but I've had that sort of day where purchase, I'm worth it. So we can use a lot of, we can use psychological value factors in setting our prices. We can set a price so that the paying of that price is part of the co-creation of value for the individual. Which brings us down to our marketing question of how do we approach price as a marketer? Uh, look, I'm going to deal with the bottom one first. One of the ways we often approach price as a marketer is to gently handball it to someone beside us and say to accounting, hey, figure out what we should charge for this. Call us back. I don't think that's a good use of marketing skill set. I think we should be in here on the strategy and the tactic. There's a bunch of maths. Uh, the textbook does a good job of covering them around demand curves, the economics of supply and demand. But that's still rational-based pricing. Where our strength lies as marketers is in positioning, messaging, and signaling. Now, there are strategic choices around how and what the price of a product does in terms of the role it plays in the firm and the organization. But there's also the tactical considerations of referent pricing and competitor pricing and using the value on the sticker as a positioning strategy to locate yourself in the market then to support that value through the rest of your marketing mix uh, and to activate that position through your promotion and communication that you've established by going, we're cheaper than or more expensive than a rival product. So messaging, market signaling, and positioning, I think, are the real strengths of marketing's engagement with price. On the strategic front, it's a really interesting four-way dance here. On the one hand, if we are profit-driven, as our marketing strategy, our strategic goal is profit, we need to bring in the maths, we need to bring in the total cost of the production of the product, we need to use a lot of the economics to make certain that we are charging enough per unit to cover not just the cost of the unit, but the cost of all the rest of the production, including all the marketing messages, including keeping the company alive with the lights switched on and the internet connected whilst we're selling our stockpile of goods. So profit orientation, requires a lot of calculations. Sales orientation is a little dangerous when we start getting into price-based sales. Uh, we start moving away from really thinking about what's the, what's the value of the product to the market and are we teaching the market to, to devalue our objects by getting them to wait for sales. In the middle is a positioning strategy. This is the idea of the competitor-based positioning, where each time we are setting our price at roughly the same as our competitor, but we have got our per unit costs below our competitor's costs, and therefore, on a one-to-one, -one, we sell exactly the same as our nearest rival. We will make more money than they will. This is super dangerous as a strategy, again, because it's moving away from thinking what does the price do as a signal? What is the role of the price as a means to position? What it can do, though, is also can lead to this idea that if we can produce our product for cheaper than our competitor does, then we could offer it for cheaper on the assumption that cheaper means more sales. 
that doesn't always work. One of the things, one of the super effective things in marketing is when we have a very cheap to produce product that is tied to a brand and a messaging strategy that means people want to pay a premium for our low cost to produce but high price to buy product. That's how you get good profit margins because there is an intangible social message attached to this object and that gives us the room to charge more. People are buying the value of association with the brand and they'll pay a premium for association for good brands. The final one is I think the market of strength and that is perception based pricing. But to do this obviously we're going to need market research and we're going to need a positioning strategy and our positioning strategy is going to need to help us understand the referent pricing points of our nearest competitive value offers. Attached to this as well, uh, since we've talked about new product development, let's talk briefly about new product pricing. This is an either or. You cannot have both strategies. You either have penetration pricing or you have price skimming. On the penetration pricing, you start with introductory discounts. You lower the price because you want to acquire the customer and the market share. The danger here is that you teach the market that your penetration price, your low entry price, is the appropriate reference price. It works well where you're bringing a new product into a competitive environment where uh, early majority and late majority already have, already are consuming these products, so they've already set a reference price. So they know that, oh, look, it should be worth, you know, that you see a product, oh, it should be worth about 10 bucks. So I pay about 10 bucks for that. Penetration pricing says early discounts or introductory discount, $8. You're like, that's 20%. Yeah, okay, that, uh, it makes it worth my time to try it. And then you get access. Your product needs to then win on relative advantage because cost will not stay being an advantage. It suits second mover advantage. It suits people coming into an established market. Price skimming, on the other hand, is where you go in on a high premium and you're using your expensive introductory price as a means by which you're going to recoup the research and development costs and also appeal to the innovator and the early adopter. Innovators have a high tolerance for financial risk and they're reasonably wealthy and can take a hit. So if you introduce a new price at a price skimming approach and only a select group of people can afford it, the early adopter market is also very interested because now they can see a point of differentiation. They, if they can afford this, that sets them apart from their followers who may not be able to. Of course, once you've been in the market for a little while, particularly as a first mover, your first mover advantage, you'll suddenly find that there's a bunch of penetration pricing, me too clone knockoffs using second mover advantage on you to try and take your market share. But if you've come in first and you've priced properly, you should be able to take a good positioning strategy, establish a strong reference price, and turn profit on the products in terms of being able to recover your initial development costs and perhaps set up the requisite cash flow investment to be able to work on generations two, three, and four of the quite new to continuous products. On the tactical side, now we've mentioned a bit about positioning. I want to talk about the price for signaling and how that lets you drive price for positioning. Price can be used as a quality signal. So humans, by and large, like to retroactively decide and make decisions that they remember making first, but really we made second. And one of the places we do that is on the perception of what something was worth if we paid a lot of money for it. So the more expensive an object is, the more likely we are to imbue it with the quality signal to say, 
I'm smart, I'm clever, I wouldn't pay money for rubbish, this is super expensive, it's got to be good, therefore I'm going to perceive it as good because it's expensive. You rationalise, you solve your cognitive distance by going, yep, $1,500 for a front row ticket to a concert, yes, that was worthwhile because it was a life-changing event, it was the best concert I've ever been to. Your rationalisation circuit kicks in and you use the price as your benchmark for it must be good, it's expensive. Now what we can also do is we can set then, because quality and price are co-connected, we can do a demand approach where we set a high price to establish a social status. You must be yay rich to ride approach. And then we, draw, then we advertise to people who can't afford the product. We support our demand, our luxury pricing position, by communicating the value, how if you have one of these, you know, a number of times I've seen $10,000 watches advertised in the Canberra Civic Centre. I mean, come on, who's rocking down through North Quarter with a cold 10k spare to go, hmm, I'll go a watch. But status symboling, showing to the world, character with a watch like that, them, they're important. So you're creating the demand through the social messaging, through the use of your promotion, and your price positioning is allowing you to limit the number of people who have this and therefore reach into that early majority, that early adopter market, and some of the top end of the early majority. So it's a social signaling tool. If you can afford this, you're worth it. On the other end of the charts, we have, and this is where we sort of talk about exclusivity as well, um, just pick that up on the way through. You can artificially inflate the demand for something by artificially inflating its price. One of a kind, $10,000. Someone with $10,000 can go, hmm, I'd be the only person with that. There isn't really a demand for it until you say it's scarce. And then once it's scarce, people are like, I want one, I need them. And this is how we have run, uh, well, this is how we end up with a run on basic supplies because people perceive scarcity. Scarcity triggers fear of missing out. Fear of missing out triggers irrational purchasing decisions which we can leverage for value. If your ethics just didn't uh, ring then, get better ethics. Down the bottom of the price of signaling is convenience. Now convenience-based pricing is where we openly signal cost says time. Proximity, so this is where convenience-based pricing, if you think about things like festivals, nightclubs, 24-hour trading, the 7-Eleven and the Night Owl, where yes, you could get it cheaper if you were prepared to travel further or wait longer. You're paying for the proximity. You're paying a premium price to access something at a convenient time, place and space for you. So convenience pricing requires you to link in the distribution channels and make certain that you are putting your convenience premium at a place where you don't have a lot of competition or there's a reason why it's worth someone paying the above market rate because what you are adding is not just the value, this base value of the product, you're adding the value of here and now. Available here and now, worth that extra couple of dollars. So. That's your signaling side. The positioning side, based on all of this, is there are only three positions that you can occupy in price. Remembering the total price concept, you are either at the market, in which case you are, your price is not a driver. Your price is defensive, you are then going to need to use your positioning strategy, the rest of the mix, 
but you are within the realms of the acceptable. You can then go above the market, or you can go below the market. Below the market, you, are, you position yourself as the cheaper alternative, the knockoff brand, the discount brand, the I can't believe it's not the real brand brand. And that's OK. That's a really good strategy because you're leveraging on some form of tactical advantage, some form of strategic advantage. You can produce the product faster, cheaper, quicker. And you produce it at lower cost. So you can occupy the below market. So again, it's about your positioning strategy. It's about your uh, market strength. It's about understanding your internal strengths. Can we make it cheaper? Can we, for every unit we sell, will we be able to turn a profit? Will we be able to turn a profit at this price we're offering? And if we're turning that profit at a price lower than our competitors, then we're going to pick up a certain type of customer and clientele who would like the benefits of the leading of the at market brand, but can't afford that slightly higher price, so they'll pick up our mostly acceptable product alternative. If you are in the lead, by the way, strategically, below market, one of the things about strategic below market is that your value offer also needs to be below market. If your value offer is at parity at market and you're selling below market, you're missing an opportunity. You could probably sell at market. If you are better than the more expensive brand, then you have definitely done something wrong if your relative advantage beats their relative advantage and you're cheaper than them, then you are missing an opportunity. At the above market positioning, this is premium. This is premium pricing. For every product that exists, there is a space in the positioning continuity for a more expensive version, the high fashion, elite, luxury, prestige, exclusive version, and a position below it, the knockoff, cheaper, the also ran. There's always a position around it. There's always a chance to go higher or go lower. And it's uh, there because that's Reference brand, the brand sitting in the middle, provides the customer with a point of contrast that you can use in your positioning strategy. You can think, we're just like Qantas, only cheaper, Jetstar. We're not like Qantas, but only cheaper, Virgin Blue. Or we're like Virgin Blue, but more expensive because we're better, Qantas. So everyone's got a positioning strategy they can take based on their pricing. It's up to us as marketers to capitalize on these opportunities. But one, again, one mistake that we often encounter is that people will try and price themselves below their competitor on the assumption that, oh, well, we, we meet them on all the value, on all objective value elements. If we're cheaper, we'll be perceived as better was missing the subjective quality signal opportunity, which was we offer almost identical outcomes. Can we offer them a sense of superior quality by being more expensive? Can we go above? So never miss the chance to look at positioning yourself above a market price to attract the top end, the elite customer, the customer who's looking to differentiate themselves by spending that little bit more. They want the gold-plated version. They want the Rolls-Royce. The fact that Rolls-Royce is the brand you recognize as the premium luxury version, when they're an aircraft engine manufacturer. We don't talk about it being the Boeing. We don't talk about the, ah, I want the, uh, listen, I'm not after the Rolls-Royce option. Can you give me the Boeing option? We don't, their brand isn't synonymous with quality. So, Quality signaling at price levels, using price to signal a quality which you reinforce with branding and marketing communications. Of course, it helps to have a really good quality product as well. All right, uh, a couple of these, what I'm referring to as the select known financial costs. It's not everything from the front list. Uh, it's the ones I find most useful. 
risk get a bonus level because I've I actually did my honest thesis on risk, so I'm super keen on that theory. The costs, the non-financial costs that you really want to factor in when you're trying to position a product, but also when you're analyzing a product, looking at it, saying, well, what's this product cost me? How long does it take to acquire, use, and then get benefit from the product? One of the things that makes a gym membership so expensive is that it's not just the $30 a month fee. It's not just the one hour in the aerobics class. It's the 30 minutes to get there. It's the hours to do the aerobics. It's the 30 minutes afterwards, the shower, the downtime, the additional levels of washing, the additional levels of protein powders, the preparation before, the preparation afterwards. And your one hour class suddenly starts getting longer and larger and bigger. So it's really important to have a true and accurate map of what time commitment someone needs and then look at whether you premium. And that's the other thing I want to point out here is price applies premium at market and below market apply to all of the non-financial costs. So you can have a time premium. You can have a very time expensive product which then eliminates a section of the market who can't afford the time. And if you combine time premium and cash premium, expensive and slow, then you are signaling luxury. Who's got a day to spend on this and the money to pay for it? And the money to not need to be spending that day working to earn more money. So there's premium pricing is always an option in all of this. Similarly, effort. Effort is going to be the psychological and the physiological expenditure. Premium effort price, below effort price, at market effort price. Does your value offer require people to put in more, exert more energy and more effort? That's a feature you can sell. A longer marathon, a harder gym program, a tougher video game, a more obtuse book, a worse to watch film, a terribly complicated TV series where it's all really, really complicated, nothing makes sense. Oh wait, that's lost. And okay, just don't Game of Thrones it, all right? If you, don't change the effort level on the way through. Don't stuff for those elements. Another non-financial cost is uh, the cost between first acquisition of the product and your sense of the best value you're getting from the product. So the learning curve, the difficulty with which you go from beginner to satisfied you're getting your value. Energy, again, physically draining. Now effort is the psychological and physiological expenditure. It's the in the moment. Energy is the recovery time required. So going back to the gym example, one of the things about a gym is the membership, the energy requirement of a membership. If you're training once a week, low intensity gym workout, low effort, low time cost, but you're not seeing your learning curve, your gap between engagement and results is going to be quite wide. Whereas if you're trying to crunch up the gap and get a little more outcome faster, you've got to spend a little more energy and then you've got a longer recovery time. Put more effort in, expect more energy cost. A triathlon takes training to prepare for. It's not just, I'm going to spend $180 registering myself for a sporting event. I also need to spend all the time preparing for that sporting event and all the energy, all the effort, all the lifestyle factors. Same again, energy is premium energy. You can charge it as exhausting but exhilarating. Low energy is, we've automated some of this. Lifestyle, again, pr premium and below market. The extent to which a product integrates itself is the extent to which the costs associated with things like the observability and the compatibility and the other elements 
even the relative advantage. Does it plug in? Does it support? Does it make the customer feel part? At market, it slots into the lifestyle. Below market, it's already part of the lifestyle. You just didn't know you needed to use the object to make it happen. Above lifestyle is you're buying this product for the fact it will change your lifestyle. And then we go into risk. And risk is both feature and cost. So you should always look at the inherent risk of your product as the potential for your product to have a new value offer. So the five most common ones are financial, social, physical, uh, internal, psychological, and performance. Top of the list, financial. What is the risk of using the product? Is there a risk that it will cost you more than you expected? Gambling is the perfect financial risk product because the point of the exercise is to risk losing money and to lose money over an extended period of time in the pursuit of maybe winning more money back. The social loss, what's the risk of you taking a hit to your pride or your reputation as a result of the use, the observed use of this particular product? And every single one of us has one of those products in their list that if your mate knew you used it, you wouldn't be able to look them in the eyes. And for some people, those of us who unironically like the Cats movie from 2019, it's not that one. Oh, the judgment that just came through from that. But also, social prestige loss is an in-group, out-group opportunity. So if something's a high social prestige risk, and you find someone else who's in the, that social prestige risk club, then you've got a point of bonding and it becomes a point of value. It becomes, we are part of an in-group against these others. Feature become, cost becomes feature. Physical risks, the risk of harm or injury from the use of the product. Every product comes with harm or injury risks. Some of them are weirder than others, and occasionally when you look at a warning label on a product, you sit there and go, how did that become a message we had to tell people about? But the idea here is that there's a certain level of physical risk with every product. Some products sell physical risk as a feature, so you don't want to downplay it because it's a benefit. Others, you want to downplay the risks because it's a cost. Same for the internal, psychological, the, the effects of using a product. Every single movie on the planet has an internal psychological impact, particularly Cats 2019 for its absolute horror. It's one of the best horror movies that's ever been created. It just wasn't marketed like that. It was marketed like a musical, but musicals are inherently terrifying. So the idea of, again, you pay money and you experience in return fear, horror, anguish, a whole bunch of uh, what would we would technically call unsettling and unpleasant emotions. Sometimes that's a risk and that's a, hey, I didn't expect that. That's a heavy cost. Other times it's a benefit because you just handed over $25 to go into a haunted house theme ride and some guy in a Grim Reaper outfit just caused you and your partner to scream. And your heart's doing the, you're doing the biophysical feedback response of you've had a terror experience, but it's what you paid the money for, so you're getting your benefit. There's also that internal psychological cost of whatever the sensation is when you lose Super Smash Brothers or Mario Kart at that last second. Or when there's one hit point left on the enemy boss and you've just run out for the last time. Like, it's been 12 goes and you just can't do it anymore. It's just like, nah. Finally, there's always performance risk. And this is that every product that has been purchased as an offering that has value has the risk of not providing value. That's harder to sell as a feature, so that's probably the one that's the closest to a straight cost. But even so, 
Something that fails, which then allows the consumer to co-create a solution to the failure to get a better product, has benefits. So the final thing on the consumer price perception to talk about is primary cost and secondary cost. Primary cost is the cost of acquisition, search, and we've mentioned those, but also shipping costs. Quite often as marketers, we focus a lot on the financial price, and we focus a lot on some of the really obvious search-based costs, that then we forget the last mile. And you just need to go shopping on Etsy to have that moment of going, looking at a particular product and going, I like that, that's you know, $20 for a small little uh, pin, small little metal object, and you're like, yep, yep, that's worth, I'm looking at going, yeah, I'd be happy to pay 20 bucks for that. And then the shipping is $30, and suddenly this total price is $50 American or $80 Australian. And you're looking at going, no. No, that's gone from within my reference price to that's premium. I don't have the money for that sort of thing. I'm not going to drop. Because the shipping cost tipped it out of the reference price category. So it's one of the things you've got to watch for and why marketing needs to be holistic. If you are going to do a total price concept and try and occupy a price position, then it has to be the total price including shipping. If you're not factoring that in, you're not doing your total price properly. Your secondary costs are consumables and ancillary upgrades. So consumables are basically things like toner cartridges. You buy an Xbox, the Xbox is inherently useless until you buy a game for the Xbox. And now suddenly you've got $500 lump of useless for which you need to spend $70 tokens each time to make it useful. But then you also end up on the ancillary upgrades path where you start buying additional hardware because you bought one thing and then that sets off a, it triggers a needs analysis which sets off the next thing. And, you know, I going to say that I am as vulnerable to it as anyone because the computer that I'm recording this on shipped with a perfectly adequate keyboard and mouse and then I bought myself the upgrade, a gaming keyboard and then I bought myself the upgrade gaming keyboard because I realized after using the first keyboard for a while that it was good but there was better, and I wanted better. And it's an ancillary upgrade. It's as a result of consuming one product, realizing that I want there to be a better experience on the next. So it becomes a sequence of costs. Uh, it's the IKEA trap. You go to IKEA to buy a bookshelf, and then a few weeks later, you're back in IKEA buying a dozen other things because once you brought that new object in, it changed your perception Change your tolerance for the rest of the objects in the room. So, to recap, price. It's one of our, look, as far as an area of marketing where I think that there is an inordinate amount of fun to be had using consumer behavior principles, using what we know about our ability as humans to process price as a signal of quality, I also think that this is an area where you can genuinely do good. And you can do, create benefit, psychological benefit for the customer if you understand their needs around price. Some people need premium. Some people need to feel the hunt, the thrill of the hunt of, I got the bargain. Knowing that, knowing that about your market and delivering that to them is creating value for them. It's giving them a psychological benefit. It's giving them something that they value and quite often, it can improve the profit that you can make on a product by respecting the decision frame of your customer. Sometimes people want to pay $12 for a cup of coffee because they want to feel that they have bought something 
of value for themselves and that or they'll spend twenty, thirty, fifty dollars on something for someone else that they'd spend five bucks on themselves because they want to feel that value. So draw on your consumer behavior knowledge, understand the context for purchases, understand the total price concept, and work with what the market is willing and desiring to pay. And don't underprice a market that wants to pay a premium. Respect their needs, wishes, and wants, because that's how we co-create value is by listening to what the audience needs.